And Bruce, uh, all the talk last week, of course, was about the Fed, what they didn't do, but more importantly, what they're telegraphing. And a market, when you look at what's happening in Treasuries and you look what's happening in equities right now, that doesn't seem to think the Fed is going to hold rates as high as they seem to say they are. Well, you could say that, or then you can just listen to what the man had to say at the pressure last week mm -hmm. when Fed Chairman Powell showed us the dots and shared with us that there would be only one easing this year. It's a very far cry from, you know, six that was expected by the market coming into the year. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the inflation number is getting softer and trending down towards that, you know, 2 percent goal that everyone wants to see, mm -hmm. and that's really good news. But here's the thing that I'm thinking about. If you're Fed, Fed Chairman Powell, are you going to ease so quickly when equity markets are all-time highs, job markets are incredibly strong and robust, and the economy is strong? Because if you were to ease, might it just inflate a little bit more the economy, mm -hmm. equity markets, and cause these animal spirits to come back and inflation to come back. And yeah. so they're going to go, I think, very, very slowly and very, very cautiously. So you might expect one ease or two eases and then a long pause to see, did it do anything to reinflate inflation? Yeah, but is all this uh, ends up being academic to a certain extent because we keep talking about what, what the Fed may or may not do. And the question I, really, I guess I really have is, does it matter, right, at least in the here and now, for the economy and the markets? I mean, 25 basis points, even 50 basis points of easing. Does that have a material impact? The U.S. Impact? economy is so strong, mm -hmm. and the reason why it doesn't have a material impact is because the Fed really doesn't matter. Yeah. And that's really well, that's hard like to say. Glitch. No, they don't really matter, <laughs> given the amount of fiscal stimulus that's happened. And the fiscal stimulus has been so exorbitant, so huge, never before seen in a growth market like we've had, and yet it came through in trillions and trillions and trillions. I'm talking about Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act, and, and many other acts that added trillions of stimulus at the time the Fed was, Fed was tightening. So, so I would say that you're right about that. It is a bit academic because here we are at higher rates and the economy is just fine. You have to stay bullish because the economy is strong, jobs are strong, stock market, we're going to see what's going to happen with second half earnings, and we're going to have record earnings in the third and fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, say stay bullish for equities and stay bullish for credit as well, because a higher rate environment that we're seeing is really, really bullish for the bond market. So let's get to that. Okay, so the higher equity market, the economy is really good. What's the bankruptcy situation like? I mean, are we going to see the kind of bankruptcies that everyone was sort of anticipating or the weakness that we've been anticipating? What do you what do you think? Well, first of all, I'd start with default rates. Default rates are trending around 4%. And today, about three quarters of these defaults don't come from bankruptcies, don't come from Chapter 11s. They come from these LME, these, these liability management exercises, or what the rating agencies refer to as distressed exchanges, where the creditors are crammed down. They have to receive a lower more interest payment, less principal or termed out debt, something that's adverse to them. Private equity is very smart. They're very smart to start with in buying companies and very smart when it comes to financial engineering. And what they figured out is it's really costly to put a company in bankruptcy, the business interruption cost, all the legal costs that you go through when a company's in bankruptcy for a year to two years. It's much better to extract a pound of flesh from the creditors. And with 90% of the broadly syndicated loan market being covenant light, they can do that quite efficiently okay. by taking assets, moving over to an unrestricted sub, coming up with new money solutions from folks like Marathon who will give the company, the private equity company, additional dollars, right, to make it through and at the expense of existing creditors. So what I would say is this is a very favorable environment for the credit markets because while 90 to 95 percent of the markets can sustain these higher rates mm -hmm. and you're getting paid the best yields in the generation, those other 5 to 10 percent, there's also a lot to do for us opportunistic credit managers that are providing capital solutions and these you know, solutions for these distress exchanges. Is part of that going to be in commercial real estate? Because we oh. haven't had that you know, disaster that we've been waiting for. Commercial real estate is Again, like the pig through the python, it's, it's a s slow process that's work, being worked through. So the commercial real estate debt markets are around $6 trillion. About half of that is you know, held within the banks, and about half of that is in the private credit sector between the REITs and the CMBS markets and so forth. So the good news for commercial real estate is 
and there's very good news, is valuations have stabilized. It's a big market, and there's lots of really attractive deals to do. That's the good news. The bad news is that there's about a trillion of this debt that's upside down, mm -hmm. where there's no equity left, value left, yeah. and the creditors have to work through this process of workout. And so yeah. there's a big, huge maturity wall. I, I see the, the advantage of sort of doing these kind of non-bankruptcies, whatever we want to call them, refinancings or recapitalizations, if you will. Mm. Are we just kicking the can down the road, or are we actually making these companies healthier and, in theory, more sustainable? They're more sustainable yeah. because in that process, mm -hmm. there's going to be less debt, and the cram down itself usually relates to less debt in certain cases. In other cases, you're right, you're just kicking the can down the road right. and waiting for a day out in the future. But if the companies can then grow into those capital structures, that's a very positive thing. Yeah. And so quite often with these exercises, they actually can. And sometimes, you're right, they probably can't. Yeah. And then the bankruptcy waits down the line a year or two years you know, out in the future. But in most cases, these new money solutions have the collateral that protects them. And so they're senior, they're secured, mm -hmm. and they have the collateral with the covenants in place. And so it's really a good, attractive way to put out money. Mm -hmm. And I look across Marathon's book of all these capital solutions we've done, it's across industries, mm -hmm. because private equity is invested across industries, and you're seeing this high debt burden not impact just one or two sectors, but really all industries. Bruce, how do you think about the election? How do you think about election risk right now? Well, look at the election risk we just saw in France, right? Where Macron called for an early election, and he's still going to remain president, but you know the, the parliament is up for grabs, and it looks like his party's going to lose a bunch of votes, and votes are going to go to the far right and far left. And what did the stock market vote for? Well, the CAC, 40, which is the French stock market, was down 6.2% on that news. And French bonds, which are the oats, widened out 28 basis points relative to bonds. That's the biggest gap in debt versus, you know, our versus uh, debt markets and equity markets versus our equity markets is up that we've seen in tw like 15, 20 years. So elections do matter, and we saw that right there, right? And so six of the seven G7 countries are up for election this year. And so it's a big year. You're right. It's the year of the election. Here in the United States, we have a big election. And although we try to stay away from politics, this is going to affect markets in a very big way. So think about several things. Number one, the border itself. That's probably one of the top issues. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to talk about border because it doesn't relate to the economy. Well, yes, it does. The number one driver of employment over the last three years has been immigration. You take immigration out, jobs are flat. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they've been growing by leaps and bounds, hundreds of thousands a month, you know, month after month for three years now. We've had this gr great employment growth, mm -hmm. and it's because of immigration. So that's one factor. The second factor is regulatory and regulatory capture and everything related to, you know, big government versus kind of pro-business, right? And so when you think about the former president who wanted to take a you know, hands-off approach to business versus the current administration, President Biden, and FTC, which has been kind of anti these big M&A transactions, you'll see a very different outcome. Mm -hmm. The investment bankers and corporate CEOs are probably lining up if the former president were elected to announce deals sometime going into next year versus kind of hands off right now with certain of these companies. And finally, what I'd say is taxes. It's a very different tax stand right. um, that the that President Biden would have versus, you know, versus the former president mm -hmm. with respect to corporate taxes, as we all know, mm -hmm. and what the implications are there for companies, as well as the impact to higher taxes uh, for the wealthy. So very different policies right. and a lot on the line. A lot of people would say very different policies, but when you look at history, at some point it kind of balances itself out, at least from an investment perspective. Is there a point in time uh, in this election cycle where it is appropriate to actually act 
on the potential for what could happen? Do you wait till after uh, the election? Do you front run it? What do you do? Well, one of the greatest yeah. trades over this last 15, 20 years is when President Obama was elected and knowing his stance on health care mm -hmm. and buying into health care companies in advance of him taking office. Mm -hmm. And that had legs that took us from years and years and years on and is still working to today based upon Obamacare and all the policies and measures that were put in place. So, so yes, I think these implications of what one administration, um, our current administration, might take versus the former administration might take is very different and will have implications for, for sectors and for companies specifically. One thing that seems to stay the same in all the research that I read is that the budget deficit and fiscal deficit is going to grow. Like, no matter who's in the White House, there's going to be more money in different ways coming in. Um, do you think that's a, that effect? Like, is that true? Do you look at it like that? Is there a long-term bond deal play? It didn't used to be the case, yeah, but totally. now I think it more is the case and what's baked in. Um, and so I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I was you know, rather disappointed you know, to see how much the deficit grew during the Republican administration, because I'm all for you know, fis fiscal austerity or, or you know, fiscal strength, and, um, and how it's you know, been rel relatively indifferent. But what I would say is I think we'd have slightly bigger deficits with the uh, current administration that we would with the former administration because I think the former administration has learned from that and wants to downsize government and wants to downsize a lot of the benefits that so many folks are, have enjoyed in these last few years. And I think there it actually might be a little greater than what the commentators yeah. are stating and versus what you've so seen in these last few years. We only have about 30 seconds left. But on that point, though, are we focusing too much on the president himself? I mean, I think about the elections that we just mm. had overseas. That was less about the man at the top and more about the legislatures or the parliaments. And I wonder if we're going to find ourselves in the same situation here in the U.S. where who is in the White House is going to matter less than what the complexion of Congress Good point. Yeah. Executive order yeah. will be the order of the day. More executive order. More executive order <laughs> than, than we've ever yeah. seen yeah. going forward yeah. because that Rubicon has already been crossed.